Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jill Baird, and I work here at the museum. And this is the, the only job I have today now is to introduce our MC, and we're really pleased. Whoa. Maybe turn. Okay. Um, my only job is to learn to use the microphone. <laughs> and then, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the MC for today, Rebecca Baker, a Quag Youth and Squamish woman from, uh, who's doing a First Nations Studies uh, degree here at the University of British Columbia, and our MC for the day, if I may. Gaila Kesla Kikami, Gaila Kesla Musqueam. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CERT Defend Take Space Aboriginal Youth Conference on Identity, Activism, and Film. My name is Rebecca Baker. I'm Squamish and Quagilf, and I'm an uninvited guest here on the Musqueam Territory. I'm currently studying First Nation Studies and Law and Society at UBC, and I worked as the 2014 Native Youth Program Research Assistant here at MOA. And I work closely with the Aboriginal youth designing the tours of the exhibition, uh, Claiming Space Voices of Urban Aboriginal Youth. The museum is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkaminam-speaking Musqueam people. As uninvited guests, the museum is grateful that it is able to do its work on this land because it would not be able to do so without the Musqueam people. <clears throat> it is part of the museum's and the university's protocols to have a Musqueam person welcome us on their territory. I would like to invite Kelsey Sparrow to the stage. Kelsey is a Musqueam artist featured in the Claiming Space exhibition, and she will be giving the welcome. Kelsey, can you please come up? Um, welcome to the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I was part of the group that made the um, Musqueam Youth Claiming Space. Um, um, uh, Um, the um. Um, I was part of the the youth that made the the Musqueam youth claiming space. Um, installation at the beginning of the exhibit and I thought it was really special um, and uh, powerful that um, we were able to do this project for this um, exhibition because um, the project involved um, youth from Musqueam to go out to different traditional village sites all over Vancouver and um, like in a way, literally, like, reclaimed these places on our traditional territory and, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, and I think that that's, like, a huge part of the the section of the exhibition that it was in um, called the Indigenous Sprawl, um, which is all about relations to land and urban areas. Um, and part of being Musqueam is that there's no differentiation between like urban Aboriginal. Um, our all our traditional territory is on uh, what's like urban land now. Um, and I just wanted to also um, note that um, one of the people from my community, um, Terry Point, who is um, somebody who helped a lot with not only the piece in the museum, but the sister exhibition on the Musqueam Reservation. Um, he became very ill last night, and um, 
he is currently on life support. So if, you, if people could send out good thoughts to the family, that would be very like, meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, we gratefully acknowledge that this event is made possible in part through the two Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Insight Development Grants, Citizens of Tomorrow, Youth and New Media, and Youth pra Arts Practice as the production of knowledge for community development. I would also like to thank the public program staff for organizing today, Marion Roberts, Connie Lalo, Pilar Wong, and Jill Baird. I would also like to acknowledge Pam Brown, the curator of the Claiming Space exhibition, and Maya Tail Feathers, who was the co-curator. This conference is a companion to the exhibition Claiming Space, Voices of Urban Aboriginal Youth. This event and other events and exhibitions are part of the museum's commitment to raising awareness of Aboriginal issues and complexities. It is important to take the time to listen to both the creative works of young Aboriginal youth and their ideas. This forum will draw on various works in Claiming Space and bring together a dynamic group of youth who we can hear their take on the critical issues that they are challenged with today. It is also a testament to the many achievements and the potential that Aboriginal youth have. This event was designed as a forum where everyone actively listens and engages in discussions. So please ask questions and engage in the conversation. So just a quick overview of what's gonna to happen today. Session one is called We Are Culture and it will run until two, uh, 12 p.m. and then we'll take a lunch break until 1 p.m. Following this will be session two, The Gaze, and this session will run from 1 to 2.30 and it will be followed by a short 15-minute coffee break. The final session is called Real Medicine and it will conclude the conference at 4.30 p.m. Each session will begin with a viewing of the films and then the panelists will discuss the relevant themes and issues. And lastly, the audience will be asked to take um, part in the conversation. So session one, we are culture, youth identity, politics, and sovereignty. The moderator for this session is M Matt Wildcat. Matt is a PhD student in the political science department at UBC. He intends to explore a history of indigenous political formation within the context of settler colonialism. So could the panelists please come up? Is that? Oh. Great, uh, thank you Rebecca for the introduction and also uh, thank you Kelsey for um, your welcoming speech today. Um, so on the first session today, uh, we have uh, four films. Uh, two of the filmmakers are with us today or two of the filmmakers will be panelists, all four filmmakers are with us. Uh, and then we also have a third panelist, uh, Kelsey. Um, so the first short film uh, we have today is Nappy uh, by Damien Eaglebear. Uh, Damien is Blackfoot from Kainai First Nation located in Southern Alberta. Uh, using interviews with Blackfoot elders and others, the film is an experimental short documentary that explores storytelling and the Blackfoot trickster. Damien currently resides in Vancouver and is a graduate of the Indigenous Independent Digital Filmmaking Program and the Cinematography Program at Capilano University. Uh, and Damien is also currently a student at the in the First Nation Studies Program uh, at Simon Fraser University. S the second film is Geisen Geisen by Maria Bal Nango, a film uh, which was also f is also featured in the Claiming uh, Space exhibit. The film is a performance piece uh, working with Sammy Footwear. Uh, Maria is a Sami artist and filmmaker uh, from um, Galugarvi, uh, Norway, and is one of the artists in the exhibit. Uh, during the Ridu Ridu Indigenous Festival in 2011, she was the Young Artist of the Year, uh, where she had a solo exhibition of art and her own film program. Uh, and Maria will join us by Skype today. The third film uh, is titled Savage Diaries by Alex um, uh, Taylor McCallum. And so uh, this is funny, when I read this description of the film to Alex, he uh, kind of laughed at me and he said, he's, I just made this film when I was 17, man. <laughs> so so 
Alex uh, brings the structural barriers faced by indigenous peoples into sharp relief through an exploration of a young indigenous man attempting to go straight edge after his release from prison. So uh, McCallum created the film during the Gulf Island Film and uh, Television School on Galeala Island. Uh, he also received an award for outstanding achievement in Aboriginal storytelling uh, for his film at the Islands Film Festival, and uh, Alex continues to be a filmmaker today. Our fourth film is Indian by Rose Stefarm. Roses of Siksika, Chippewa Cree, Sartlip, Cowichan, uh, Aninan, Nakoda, Scottish, and French descent. She was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. And the film is about, I, um, in her words, a guy <coughs> who is adopted who is trying to uh, connect with his uh, real parents. She is an artist whose work spans several types of media, print, textiles, and her, uh, but her primary focus is film. Uh, Rose also produced the film A Red Girl's Reasoning as part of the Crazy Eights Filmmaking Challenge, and she is currently uh, Capilano, um, doing the, cap, um, the motion picture bachelor degree at Capilano University. And so, uh, in addition to those four films uh, and the two panelists, we are also joined today on the panel uh, by Kelsey Sparrow. Kelsey is a Musqueam youth based in Ladner, BC, and is also one of the artists in the exhibit. She is a former participant of the Native Youth Program here at the Museum of Anthropology. Uh, within the Claiming Space exhibit, you can view Kelsey's film Belonging and artwork, a hand drum that consists of Northwest Coast design, um, a, a hand drum that combines uh, Northwest Coast design with uncon unconventional contemporary design, and in doing so, allows us to reflect on the fluidity of uh, traditional art forms. So, um, are we, my understanding is that we're going to play the films first, and then we will invite uh, the panelists up afterwards for a discussion. <laughs> Hun, yep. uh, I'm speaking to the present uh, members of the tribe, uh, especially the youth and the younger members, or whoever can utilize the information that I'm, I'm providing. And also, I'm speaking to the future generation of my people. It not be noticed there was two rattles that were tied to one of the poles and they were hanging down. And he really uh, uh, liked to have them. So he, he started out this scheme as to how he's gonna do that. And he kind of sneak up to the rattles and tight them. Okay, my English name is Frank Weaglehead. Rolling Cop. Bandy Blackwater. Charlie Croce. Cowboy Smith. I want to speak about a fellow that's a trickster. He was uh, kind of a mystical character. His name is Nappy. He's an adventurer. Any mischief, anything is not done right, they blame Nappy. He's all about himself. Insatiable appetite, that's another aspect of the trickster. But he's always kind of a person that is scheming. He goes out and disturbs the nature as he's cooked. All you can eat buffet all the time. He was able to communicate with animals, mother nature, and the people. And real horny too, probably. <laughs> it's not a mean person. It's a person that likes to, to, to discover. I never heard anybody tell a story of Napua being married or Napua having children. Well, Napi was, to me, in the stories that I've told, was, he had all the characteristics. Can be good, evil, bad, uh, you know, he was always playing tricks. He's an old man, but he's still, like, that's the irony of it all. He acts like a young guy who's, like, living like a rock star almost. So Ma, the owner of the rattles, then decided, well, since not you are, really wants my rattles, I'll, I'll give it to, to him, but I'll teach him. I'll teach him how to use the rattles. But you, you have to strictly follow the rules. You must never go beyond four. If it don't work, then don't try the fifth time. Said, oh yeah, yeah, I'll follow that. And uh, they gave him the rattles and uh, Napio then packed up and he left. Some of the stories that I know, 
uh, come from, uh, a lot of it came from uh, my grandmother, Matsuyi Shepi. Closing your eyes and listening to a, a storyteller talk about these things, you kind of use your own imagination and fill in the blanks and, and riff off of what the, the storyteller's perspective is on that particular story. I was so eager to, to find out if that works. Every once in a while I go to the edge of the hill and you will try it there. And sure enough, to be a buffalo that go over. And Napia knew that he could only utilize maybe one. He started to uh, argue with himself. I was told not to do it, I better follow it. And on the other side, maybe the guy is uh, hiding something from me. So now he starts to distrust the person who was very kind to him. That's how we learn from good and bad because Napi was always doing the wrong. He went on and then he come to, to another hill and then uh, he decided, well, I'm going to try it once. So he did that, two on each side, and then the fifth, fifth one, then he didn't say to the left or to, uh, to the right. The stories don't always seem the same when I use my borrowed language, my, when I use my borrowed tongue. And he said, Tatsikacht, that's the middle. And he was being in, in the middle of the two sides. Of course, the buffaloes ran over him and over the cliff. And he, and he as, as Napiola was falling down, he turned into a... I'm going to throw that up to somebody Therefore, today we have Rattle Hill. That's near it. Could you, uh, that, that cat, could you pull that one out for me? I'm going to feed it for my, for my, my grandson. So spoil it. So the other uh, hunters of the other men, they, they pulled out the cat and then they dragged him up to the hill and they gave it to that old lady that wanted to, uh, to use it uh, for his grandson. So they brought him to the TV and he spoke to Napi is, um, do you think Napi would make a good filmmaker? Yes. <laughs> if you're crazy enough, yes. <laughs> well, he's got a lot of uh, different character, character trickster and all that, too. I think he would have made well, I think he would be well fitted <laughs> because of his predicaments that do happen to him. Why are you making it? To... You probably find a nap. He still exists. Oh, gee. 
to bring humor into the into the uh, whatever is going to be created. He would probably do everything opposite. Abdul Abdul Dose in a good villain. He'd be told what to do. He'll do opposite. He'll do crazy things with it. That's what Nampi would probably end up doing. Mm, probably not. <laughs> no, he wouldn't because he'd get craft services all day. No, he wouldn't be a good filmmaker because he'd be too egotistical. He'd be like mad at everybody. But if you look at the start of the film, maybe there'll be a lesson in there for filmmakers to follow. What not to do as a filmmaker, 100%. Everything he does, don't do what he's doing. Don't you know, shoot with the lens cap on because it's abstract and artsy. You know, I'll be, always be ready for Nafi and his friends, the Raven, Wasagichak, Nana Bush, all of these guys, gals, animals, shapeshifters. They're always watching you and waiting for the right opportunity to humble your ass because they will every single time. Just, you know, keep, keep yourself in check or these guys will check you in. I think that's the best way to do it. The elders said it right. You know, I think we're all just trying to get back to that place somehow, somewhere. And we just have very interesting tools to, to get to that place. And someday we'll get there. Someday soon, probably not, but someday. Someday. Sangal i maahte, giisua pahi, maitson varga. Alut giesat olkus kuului, alut 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 giesat olkus kuului, manne giesas sisa kuului. Manne kessas sisa kuului. Manne kessas sisa kuului. Manne, 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 manne. Iin jekoit kalka kessat. Iin jekoit kalka giesat. Manne, 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 manne. Iikolea ohtan. Jalla, 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 jalla. Gaiga. Hehteha. Hehteha. Hea padin. Nukoriv guriv 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 gu. Nukoriv gu. Nukoriv guriv 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 gu. Palga. Gosa huolkan, gosa ololle. Indejahkan jusin oinan. Indejahkan jusin oinan. Leago alma satmelas. Leago alma satmelas. 
Voi, ette voi. Leago Alma Satmelas. Ready? After I got out of jail, I saw my friend Ricky. He was using crutches, so I asked him what happened. He said he had to get his hip replaced because he choked too much bull max and scarfed down too many hot dogs all his life. I couldn't help but laugh a bit. I told him I should probably refrain from chugging beer and scarfing down hot dogs, man. <laughs> we laughed. It was what alcoholics and dope fiends will refer to as a moment of clarity. My name is Thomas Jones. My friends, though, call me Tommy Hawk. I had my first talk when I was 10 years old. My Uncle Pat gave it to me and said, Boy, you don't inhale that, I'm gonna paddle you to our ancestors' designs can be seen on your ass. So I did. And I tell you, it's bloody rough assimilation us Indians go through, even among our own kind. Since that day, I began searching for new ways to alter my state. I evolved from pothead to thieving alcoholic. I have glue, paint, ether, and gasoline. I railed coke, PCP, ecstasy, meth, Ritalin, cat tranquilizers, and heroin. I did LSD, shrooms, peyote, and any uppers and downers I could get my hands on. After both of my parents had overdosed on two separate occasions with no one else to care for me, I was adopted by a pair of Caucasian lesbians where I had resorted to drinking mouthwash and cough syrup. No matter how hard they tried, they could not restrict me from sneaking out of the house to join my friends in their acts of debauchery. They had always told me my Indian friends would get me into trouble. Maybe I should have listened more along. Hey Sarah, thank Creator, you're home. I just got out of jail. Can you please pick me up? I'm freezing and hungry. And Look, I'm sorry, Tom, but me and Lucy can't keep looking after you. For God's sakes, you're a young adult Please, now. Sarah, I have nowhere else to go. Every family member I had is dead. I just need a place to crash so I can find another job. I'm begging you, I swear. I'm turning straight at you. Well, we simply can't afford to anymore, and you and me both know that you're never going to be sober. You've said this nine times now. It was six times. Whatever. The point is, you're never coming back till you can prove yourself, Thomas Jones. Do you even know how distraught Lucy's been since you've gone back to jail? You've broken her heart. You know that? You know what? Screw you two lesbos. Let me die. No one's ever had faith in me. I'm going to prove you all wrong. No foolish. Melody, it's me, baby. I just got a joint. Damn, I miss you so much. Uh, who may I ask is calling? Mel, baby, it's me, oh, Tommy. God. Tommy, listen. Three months ago, when you went to jail, I finally took my mother's advice and decided to move on. Move on? Yes, Thomas, move on. All you do with your worthless time is mooch coin off your bull like moms, getting fat, drunk, and high while never going to school. You only have your grade nine, and with that, you'll never accomplish anything. You're no better than your dad was. Hey, don't you dare compare me to my pa, okay? I'm like him, I'm going straight at it, yeah, right? I believed you last time. You're never going to regulate your life. I found myself a real man. One who's honest, smart, rich, what? strong, and Caucasian. Who is he, Mel? I swear I'm gonna scalp him! 
I dare you to try and claim my scalp, Hatchet Packer. I'll travel to your res and burn down your wigwam. Got it? Now let me and Melody fornicate in peace before you upset her further. What? How come Sean and Yop on a pool and Mama Pop? Who it is, boys? Tommy Hawk, free at last from captivity. What up, Freddy? You guys get out of here, man. Take a hike, bitches. Let's talk. We're gonna talk. So? Listen, man. I don't have anywhere else to go. But lesbian moms kick me out. Do you think I can just crash in your car and I'll find another job? You don't even have to ask, bro. The car's yours. Go right ahead, man. Here, bro, I bet you've been craving a taste. Have a little sip. No, Freddy. I've got straight edge, man. I'm gonna die if I keep on chugging. You're kidding me, man. No. Think it's time for a little celebratory relapse. No, Freddy, I'm serious. Seriously? Is this your way out of the closet, you whippy chug? You're officially not worse than these fucking Galliano hippies. Fred, come on! You're the only friend I have left in this world. Whatever, man. You're banished from this res, you brown sheep. If I ever catch you here again, I'll castrate you. You're not even from here, man. Whatever. And that was it. Everyone I had known had disowned me, left me for child predator bait in the wilderness. It seemed that my life up until this point had been nothing but an unfortunate series of blackouts and acid flashbacks. Now that I actually wished to rehabilitate myself, no one was left to assist me. I was all alone. So she stumbled my way, that is. Hey. Hey, you. You're in my camping spot. Oh. Uh, what's wrong? What's your name? My name is Thomas. My old friends used to call me Tommy Hawk, though. No way! This is the coolest name I've ever heard on this boring island. Yeah? Yeah. What's your name? Delia. You know, you know people say that Delia was the name of the devil's daughter. Didn't know that. Hmm. So, what's got you down? Well, I just got out of jail yesterday. My foster moms kicked me out of the house. My Axe left me for an idiot. All my friends have ditched me. Frankly, I think I've lost all faith. Jesus. Mm. Yeah, I, um... Since I ran away from home, I've got no friends left either. What did you go to jail for? Well, it's... pretty really embarrassing. You know. Oh, come on, it can't be that bad. It's mortifying. I was found. I was found nude and drunk while loitering on public property. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was mortifying. I'm I'm sorry. I can't help it. I uh, <laughs> uh, I was actually arrested for stealing panties from a thrift store, and it uh, doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> hey, I uh. I know to cheer you up. What? I stole some money from Rachel Geezer last night, and, uh, well, I think you could use a, a shot, a rail, and a joint. Here. 
I don't know. I've been. This sore. is where I have to ask myself the question. Come on. Most Indians will unfortunately have to ask themselves in their lives to drink or not to drink. You know what's great? Thank you, Kessica. Oh, shit. Don't say something for me. <laughs> wow. Consider this ending happy or sad, quite possibly the beginning of the end. Whichever you decide. But during this magic moment, I realized I could either fight to stay sober in rehab, commit to a life sense of useless education, and slave away for currency, Whitey's worst invention. Or I could remain wasted till death with this beautiful white woman. I tell you the straight edge life is much too boring. Don't judge me. What would you do? Ich würde vorschlagen, dass wir uns erstmal einen Bus kaufen. Rot, blau, schreibnack. somebody from a ritual geezer last night and uh, I think you uh, I think you need a shot of rail and a, a joint I don't know I'm sober for a while come on this fucking tank you know what <laughs> <laughs> what oh, that's what? such a good one too Printed some resumes for you. You go to the Powell this weekend? Why would I? Where are you from? India, I think. <laughs> Don't you know? Could be Indo Canadian. Very PC. Many questions. You don't answer them. I'm adopted, okay? So you've never met them? Nope. Happy with the parents I have. How can you know who you are if you don't know where you're from? How was your day? <laughs> oh, it was great. I bumped into an old friend down at the store. It was good. I saw an old classmate. I meant the job. I handed out some resumes. I'll find a job. I called the adoption agency today. Why? I want to meet my parents. Who are your parents? I know that, but... We raised you! We love you so much. I know. Uh, it shouldn't mean that I can't meet them. What are you guys scared of? They don't want anything to do with you. They put you up for adoption. Besides, they're in India. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> then go. Hey. I have one more meeting, 
and then we can go for dinner. <laughs> yeah, just another one of these last puppies. <laughs> oh. Oh. Let me call you back, okay? Hey, Daniel, how's it going? Please have a seat. Hey, before we go any further, you should know that it could be a very long and emotional process when trying to find one's parents. I have to meet them. Okay, I understand that, and I've heard that many times in this office, but sometimes the birth parents do not wish to be contacted. Are you able to provide me with their names? What is that? It's a list of questions I've created from my parents. I've had it for as long as I can remember. Listen, I really want to help you get the answers. I just don't know if they're the right ones. Thank you. Good luck. What's that? Well, I have to go. Where? Meet my mom. Your mom's in the bedroom. You know what I mean. Think of her. Every straight knee, cold and flu. Who stayed up with you at night when you weren't feeling well? She was there when it mattered. She changed your diapers, bought you clothes. Every parent-teacher meeting, graduation. Did your birth mother do any of that for you? I have questions to ask her. If you go, and I mean this, don't come back. Daniel, I'm her son. You gave me up for a reason. I need answers. Will you go away if I give them to you? Yes. And you won't come back? Not if you don't want me to. Your First Nations? Yeah. From where? Squamish. Why'd you give me up? I was 19. It was too late for an abortion. My parents were messed up from residential school. You deserved better. It's late. Did you ever think about me? I tried to forget. Move on. You should too. Where are you? I'm fine. Are you okay? Is dad still mad? Come home. I'm at the park down the street. worried about you. Are you okay? Yeah. You upset? Oh, I... I knew at some point you'd want to meet your real mother. I didn't do it to hurt you two. I just needed answers. I know. I know. Uh, does she live around here? She doesn't want anything to do with me. 
Oh. And Dad? Oh, you're coming home. You misinterpreted a, misinterpreted a key piece of information. Hmm? At the adoption agency, they said I was Indian. Hmm. They didn't mean East India. I'm Coast Salish. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, no more curry? <laughs> um, how about some salmon? Thank you very much to uh, all of our filmmakers. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> um, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, our two panelists up to the front. So Rose and Kelsey. And so I uh, just learned that uh, Maria is not uh, joining us on Skype today, so we'll have the two panelists. Um, but the other two filmmakers are also in the audience, and uh, maybe if they feel comfortable, they can also answer some questions. Um, so do you guys have any opening remarks you would like to make? Rose, can we start with you? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just dealing with the loss in my community right now, so I'm kind of in a different headspace right now. But uh, I'd rather be here than in my house, just kind of like on my own. <laughs> Sorry to hear about your loss, Rose. Um, I don't know. I just found myself like laughing a lot during those films. They were really like really good to like lift my mood, I guess. Great, thanks. So um, with that, uh, we can open up to uh, audience questions. And is there a mic in the audience as well? The cordless mic. Yeah, come on up. Sorry, just before we uh, get to questions, Alex, did you have uh, any comments you wanted to make uh, about the film? Um. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um. One thing I forgot to mention to you. To Matt. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, was that, uh, from the Kwakwakwak and the Channel of Nations, and, um, I was really nervous to be, uh, showing this film today, but it, it was, uh, it was, uh, great to see something that I made, a story that really means a lot to me, um, four years after it was made. A lot of things have changed since then, and I did make a sequel that you could see called Savagery, and I'm currently uh, working on the third one right now, but um, that's all I really want to say. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, questions? Hi. Can anybody hear me? Uh, 
Hello? Hello? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> Kelsey, you said something that I think is really critical about the use of humor as a way to um, uh, pinpoint some critical issues or the approach to certain kinds of storytelling. And I wonder if some of you want to talk about the way you use humor to uh, drive home a point. <laughs> Why don't we start with uh, Alex and then we'll go to Biggie. With me? Yeah. Um. Well, uh, first of all, I'd really like to say that I really like your movie, uh, Damien, about the nab nabby? Yeah. nabby? About the trickster. It really reminded me a lot about the, the stories, that, uh, stories of in my uh, Kwak Kwaku walk side of the family about the raven, the trickster, and uh, I just thought that was uh, incredibly hilarious, and uh, I love the use of your tricksterism <laughs> and uh, satirical humor, because um, I think we as uh, um, Bokwums is how we'd say it in Kwakwa, um, uh, I really feel that uh, natives or aboriginals or uh, indigenous people, First Nations, whatever you want to call us now, um, we really have a sense of humor that is really, I think, unlike any, anyone else. Um, and I like to use uh, satire in my own way with uh, the films I've made so far. Um, like I say, uh, the movie I shown was made four years ago, so maybe uh, my, my uh, sense of humor has kind of changed a bit. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of things in that film, a lot of uh, things that I wrote that I, I wish I could have uh, changed or rewritten, but really it was uh, meant to be that way. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really know what else to say about um, tricksterism, but I'm a big fan of tricksterism, and uh, trickster tales are my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Damien? Um, I don't know. I kind of had to make a comedy about a trickster. I can't really tell a serious story about a trickster, so <laughs> <laughs> that's how I decided to approach it. And uh, I don't know. It's kind of hard to like tell a trickster story in a short film, I feel like, because all the interviews I did were like hours long, and I don't know. No one wants to sit through all that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I don't know, just my approach to it was, uh, like, how do you visualize a trickster in film, right? Because I wanted to do a documentary about it, so I kind of went to, like, the funniest filmmaker I know, and that's Charlie Chaplin, so it's just like, well, what if not be with Charlie Chaplin, but then, you know... Charlie Chaplin became a filmmaker, so Nappy had to become a filmmaker, and then he just took over the film. That's what tricksters would do, I'd assume. Great, <laughs> yeah. okay, thank you. Um, Rose, do you have any comments? Uh, thanks for everyone for being here, and I just wanted to acknowledge that one of my actors, Madeline Trabasky, is in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> um, I had a bit of an, like, it, it's a dr dramatic film that I made, a short film, and I, I really thought that it was kind of an intense subject matter, and some of the themes that I was talking about was um, adoption, and it seems kind of like a really serious matter, and um, I kind of, like, at the end, I wanted to lighten it with a little bit of humor just to get that in there because I know we all need to laugh and it's like laughter is good medicine. I know there's so many people who know that and appreciate their laugh. I, I know like in my day-to-day -day life I appreciate my good laugh of the day. I like can wait all day for it but I know like like it's it's good when I finally get that like really really good laugh. So yeah like it's 
necessary for at least some of the films that I try to help tell. Great, thanks. Um, Kelsey, did you have anything to say on the role of humor and laughter? Um, well, I, yeah, I'm just, I noticed that in like all three of the films. Um, I, like Alex's film was dealing with like really not funny subject matter, but we were laughing through the whole thing and I think that's how a lot of Native people get through things is laughing about stuff that's kind of messed up. <laughs> yeah, and then it was really nice to see um, in your film too, just like how humor is even like traditional, like it's not just something that we get through contemporary stuff with, it's part of like our, our stories and I thought it was really like clever the way that you, um, that you like incorporated the medium of storytelling to be like part of the message too. So just like how like you know like it would just like Nappy would be like playing with the 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 recording thing and it would cut out when he was just about to say something important and stuff. So yeah, I don't know. I just enjoyed everything. Great, thank you. Any other last comments? Okay. Um, can we take another question from the audience, please? Okay, there's a question right there. Um, I was, uh, saw the credits and I noticed uh, Chris Bowles uh, yes. was working on your project, and uh, I was curious because uh, I know a bit of his story about um, leaving, uh, leaving uh, his home. And I was wondering how if how that worked in a mentorship uh, process for you. And I know he's also a film anchor. Um, sorry, what what was the question exactly? Um, about Chris? Uh, yeah, I was. What was uh, the... Yeah, just curious how uh, the mentorship uh, worked for you in your creative process, and and what he was able to sort of uh, lend down to you. <clears throat> well, uh, I was 17 when I first met him four years ago, and uh, immediately we just really um, we just really became friends right away because uh, um, me and him are uh, similar in our <laughs> in uh, in our own ways. Um, he's one of the rare uh, rare uh, natives I've met who uh, was really into metal and punk, punk rock music. And uh, you know, we have a lot of similar tastes. And uh, really, uh, we got along uh, extremely well in the Aboriginal Media Intensive program. And uh, he, he taught me a lot. He's, he's still my uh, film mentor. He helped me make the second movie, Savagery, the sequel. And he, I just had a meeting with him recently and hung out with him and uh, chatted and basically pitched my idea to him about our uh, third film, Savaged. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he, he taught me a lot and helped me write it. Uh, and um, to be honest, he's like my favorite actor. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's really, uh, I've seen him play some hilarious roles in other uh, students' films. And um, he really helped me get through it because that film almost was never made. Originally, I wanted someone else to act in it from uh, who, another fellow student in that program. And uh, it didn't really work out. Um, we had some great locations, and uh, it almost never got made. So I was really sad and depressed. I was like, ah, oh, no. <laughs> I won't get the chance to tell my story, you know, and uh, make my, um, you know, first first real uh, movie. Um, but he he helped me out. He calmed me down. He's like, Alex, you you need to be the uh, Tommy Hawk or Thomas Hawk Jones the <laughs> Third. Is his uh, full name. Um, Kind of like my uh, uh, 
maybe alter ego or um, uh, multiple, mul I don't know how to say that, Diff uh, <laughs> like mul multiple personality, I guess. It's me, and, me and Tommy are very similar. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna, kind of getting off a uh, sidetrack, but um, yeah, he really helped me out and he, he told me, he's like, Alex, you, you need to do this and we can still make this movie. So we, we picked different locations. Uh, originally in the first scene, we're supposed to be in a graveyard. Um, and uh, so we picked some different, uh, different locations and uh, yeah, he, he really helped me um, and told me to uh, kind of smarten up when I was <laughs> um, not performing well or <laughs> But in a nice way. <laughs> um, but I could talk about uh, Chris all day. He's a uh, great. He's fantastic. He's a great mentor, and uh, he's like a like a uncle to me. <laughs> yeah, he's a fellow. He's a fellow trickster as well. You'd probably yeah, if you've met him before, you'd probably know that. You know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what else to say about that. Great. No, that's that, that's perfect. Um. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Okay, there's a question at the far back. I probably do. Okay. Um, we're really interested in the role of mentoring for everybody in, in film production because you don't just make a film by yourself. So can, can the other people talk a little bit about that too? Who was it that inspired you? How did you, how were you able even to make a film? <laughs> um, well, my film, uh, I was helped out by the uh, IDF program at Cap U, and geez, mentor. I don't know, I kind of just went on my own and actually made that by myself, and I think everyone kind of thought I was crazy, right, Rose? <laughs> it, yeah, they kind of didn't know what I was doing. I'm not sure if I knew what I was doing until that happened. So I don't know what I can say too much about mentorship at that point, but now I'm like, I have just a lot of contemporaries I work with, and like Cowboy Smith has kind of evolved into my mentor now, uh, slash contemporary. We tend to work together a lot, and he's taught me a lot about filmmaking. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Rose? Uh, well, I... Um from Seattle originally, and that's where I'm born and raised. And I started out acting in, in a youth theater program and um, it's called Red Eagle Soaring. And um, somebody approached me. Her name was Annie Silverstein later. Um, like I, I went to a Q&A. I started acting in um, short films for students. And then somebody asked me if I ever thought about being on the other side of the camera. And I said, no, not really. It sounds like a really cool idea, though. And then um, later Annie approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in being involved with her organization called Native Lens, where they'd go to the outlying reservations of Seattle and teach Native youth how to use film to tell stories. So I consider her one of my early mentors. And then later I got um, introduced and started working with Tracy Rector uh, with Longhouse Media and was on a board of directors for them for um, several years. And then um, like from there, I decided to go to Capilano University. Um, and I took the Indigenous Independent Digital Filmmaking Program. Um, I got the diploma, and then um, I met some people there. And it, Damien and I went through that program together at the same time. Um, and then after that, I took the cinematography program at Capilano University. And right now, I'm, I'm at the Motion Picture Arts uh, bachelor degree program right now. So um, through Capilano University, I've had a lot of faculty there who have seen me there and, and kind of like are kind of helping me along. But um, I've also met a lot of filmmakers um, at that school, but also um, through, like, um, I met Maya. She's a good person that I'm happy I can, I can say I've worked with and um, other people too. So um, I've had a really supportive community and I've had a lot of opportunities. And one thing that I'm looking forward to is sharing my knowledge and giving back. So um, those are the kind of the key people I can think of like right now. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Kelsey, do you have any comments on uh, mentoring and film? Um, actually, um, so the, 
doing the Native Youth Program here at the museum was the first time I ever got to try out filmmaking. And Rose was one of our big mentors during that program. Uh, one of our projects was to create a short film during the summer. And Rose, like most of us, hadn't even like used a camera before, like a video camera. So Rose taught us about like all the mechanics of it and gave us a lot of like advice. And Maya was there too, Maya Tailfeathers. Um, and she helped us with coming up with like our concepts and ideas for our short films. So, I mean, you said that you were looking forward to like giving back, you already have been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I. I don't know if I'll continue doing short film, but I was really grateful to like get the chance. And now that's another medium that I have that I can use to like um, try and articulate my ideas with. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, can I get someone else from the audience uh, who wants to ask a question? Sure. No. <laughs> Please. Uh, about mentors, uh, all I really want to say is that um, a lot of people in my family are my mentors. My mom is one of my biggest mentors, and my dad, and my, gra my great grandparents, and my neutral side of the family, and uh, a lot of my <laughs> aunties and uncles, where I get my kind of sense of humor from. <laughs> um, besides that, there's Chris Bose, of course. There's some other people at the uh, Gulf Island Film and Television School who really taught me a lot. Um, right now, I'm in a, a program called Intersection Media, and actually one of my mentors is in the audience right now <laughs> from that program. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of people from that program are my mentors. My friends are my mentors. Uh, um, my friends are especially my mentors when they give me um, uh, feedback on uh, when I when I ask them about my <laughs> films and they give me wicked suggestions and things that I use and or things that I uh, yeah um, write down for future projects or ideas and um, yeah <laughs> that's good. So I actually, um, just as maybe a quick follow-up to the uh, question about mentorship, uh, you guys um, listed um, all the ways in which you've got support over the years, but how, um, how would you say that's uh, shaped you as a filmmaker? How has uh, my mentorship, or how, how has... <laughs> How have my mentors um, made me who I am today? <laughs> uh, wow, that's a that's a um, that's a challenging question. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, Yeah, I really don't know how to answer that. Um, we could come back to you. The way, uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Damien or Rose? I'm kind of having a hard time wrapping my mind around answering this, but um, like my like my mentors, like they've been a lot of my instructors at CAP, and like they've shared different like tidbits of the areas that they're experts in, like. Um, areas in particular I'm interested in are um, like above the line jobs of writer, director, um, producer, and director of photography um, for myself, but for also potentially for other people. And then um, other jobs I'm interested in are camera operator, focus puller, and um, um, like camera assistant um, stuff. But um, like right now, I, I'm a cap right now, and I'm learning a lot of film theory and. It kind of feels like it's ripping me open, and it's kind of like I'm trying to put together the pieces again. So, like, I, I feel like I'm kind of like, I don't know, like, 
I'm reassessing identity and life and film and what is everything. So <laughs> I'm feeling kind of feeling like fragmented right now <laughs> in terms of like um, like. But I feel like um, at the same time, um, some of the stuff that I'm learning is it's really strong, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that I'm learning. And um, like it's like some of the courses that I'm taking, it's like it's kind of really making my brain hurt and feel like mush. But I, I feel like it's growing pains, and it'll it'll be strong soon. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, mentorship, let's see. Uh, well, actually one of my instructors at IDF actually talked me out of going into getting my bachelor's in film. So I actually quit film school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a filmmaker anymore, so. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean I am. Uh, but what he was talking about, because I actually ran into him uh, during the summer and I was trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do and how to do it. So I went to take Indigenous Studies uh, originally here, but UBC, UBC said I wasn't smart enough, so... <laughs> SFU said I was smart enough, so that's where I'm at now. <laughs> but uh, either way, like, both film programs wouldn't necessarily transfer my, my credit, so I was kind of in a, like, a gray zone. I would, wasn't sure what to do or how to approach this problem until I ran into... He actually teaches here, Dwayne Beaver, uh, ran to him, and he just kind of suggests, he's like, well, you know how to make a film, like, what more is film school going to teach you? Um, kind of need to, like, take a, like, pick a point of view and a subject matter, like, indigenous topics, like, how to actually approach storytelling critically, right? Because he's like, well, you don't want to be, a, uh, like, just a technician, like a camera operator, kind of want to be a storyteller, uh, to a degree, and so I'm kind of struggling with that right now. Like, this is my first kind of big film. I kind of feel like it's only my good film I have. I've done a lot, but it's probably my one I feel like I've actually accomplished what I set out to do. And so with that, with Dwayne talking about that, kind of, like, set me back and really put me back to the beginning of what one, what drew me to becoming a storyteller, was really, to, uh, like, approaching Indigenous subject matter, specifically, like, within the, my nation, Blackfoot. So that's, I don't know, I'm rambling now, I don't know what I'm going. No, that was a very good <laughs> answer. Yeah, so now I'm at SFU studying Indigenous Studies and Linguistics, and it's actually a welcoming break from filmmaking, even though I'm still doing odd jobs here and there. And uh, I find my classes are actually like spurring ideas in me more than like film school, right? Because when I was in film school, it was all like kind of technical stuff and like, trying to like break the mold of like a filmmaking form, but without like any subject matter. So it was like empty stuff, empty films I felt like I was making without like a meaning. <laughs> and uh... What is my life? <laughs> I've been asking that for a while. <laughs> yeah, and so like, I don't know, just like within my like, I'm taking sociolinguistics, like giving me a lot of ideas of like, projects I want to work on, so I find like when I'm doing my readings, I just take a break and then I ended up writing like three short stories I want to develop into like films at some point, so it's, yeah, so that's how mentorship helped kind of reset me as a filmmaker. No, that was very, very, uh, no, that was a great story. Um, Kelsey, uh, do you have any um, more words to add? Well, I guess it, it feels weird answering that question because I don't consider myself a filmmaker. I made one short film with the Native Youth Program, but I mean, if I like broaden the scope a little bit um, to all the mentors that I had during the Native Youth Program, um, they they changed like the way I think about things because um, when you're like working with new medi mediums that um, you haven't before, before I mostly concerned myself with like visual art. Um, like, and fine arts, um, so, um, you know, being forced by people to think about how to tell a story or make a statement with a short film, um, that just totally, uh, it helps you, I guess, just think of things in different ways, and then I have another person who I consider a mentor here, um, Fran Cunningham, who, um, you know, she got us to do writing. I had never really done writing before. Um, we made a zine together. Um, like, yeah, just like exploring new ways to like 
tell your message or like what you want to say. Um, I think it just like it enriches like any time that you go into it. Like I think if I went back to visual arts now, like I would think about it a totally different way, and it would be beneficial. So, yeah. Great, thank you, Alex. Have you had time to? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, form to formulate your answer. So, how has how has mentor how has mentorship uh, shaped my uh, film making or storytelling? Um, <clears throat> well. I'm still having a hard time answering this. <laughs> well, um, right now in, in my uh, in, in the Intersections Media Youth and Employment Program, I have a great uh, film mentor, Fred. Um, I can't remember his last name. Forsen. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Um yeah, I have, a, I have an amazing uh, mentor at this uh, the program I'm taking right now, and uh, it's really helped me on the technological part of filmmaking because me, myself, I have a hard time with um, the whole... I'm more of a... I'm more into the script writing, storytelling, the direction... Um, acting uh, <clears throat> but yeah um, yeah a lot of my mentors have really um, helped me out in the technological um, part of filmmaking and um, someone like Chris Bose has really helped me in the uh, storytelling um, aspect of it all he he was really um, yeah, he's uh, taught me a lot about um, <laughs> maybe certain ways you should tell a story and um, certain things you shouldn't do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I really, I really don't know what to, what more to say. Uh, my mom is my best mentor, as I said before, and uh, she's made me. Um, who I am today <laughs> on this uh, stage with you all. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what to say anymore about that. No, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'll go back out to the audience for another question, if there is one. Uh, great. So there's two questions. So, um, yes. Um, hey, uh, I was just wondering if you guys could talk about projects that you're currently working on or um, interests that you have for future projects, maybe like a feature length guy or another s smaller guy <laughs> or um, even like other artists that you are really excited about the work that they're making right now. Great, thank you. Uh, is there a volunteer to start? <laughs> I'm currently working on a film, kind of. It's called The Banneking, about an... <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the people involved, Madeline. Uh, <laughs> it's about an evil piece of bannock. <laughs> uh, last I year we... Found it. Last year, we, um, me, Madeline, and my friend Colin Van Loon, we all uh, pitched to the Crazy Eights Film Festival, which uh, Maya and Rose did. And how it works is you do an in-video pitch, and then you pitch in person, and then if you're picked, you write a screenplay. And so us three, we all went, and uh, we actually got all the way to the screenwriting portion, but we were denied actually making the film. So they had like some script notes for us, reasons why they denied us. So past year I've been trying to like wrap my head around it and really figure out what I actually want to say with that and so it's actually helping me being back in school kind of getting my, my feet on the ground on that project but yeah that's what I'm working on thank you uh, Alex 
Um, well, as I mentioned uh, before, I'm currently making the third film. Um, uh, a year after I made this film, when I was 17, I made the sequel, um, Savagery, and uh, the first one was really about um, someone suffering with someone suffering with addictions and uh, you know not um, having no one no one around to really help you and it's really about uh, rehabilitation and um, <clears throat> rehabilitation and eventually in the end relapsing and the second one is more about the uh, addiction and what it really and the effects of all that and uh, so the third one um, I'm currently writing right now, um, getting all the actors together, writing, um, writing down the sets and the locations I um, want to shoot around here in Vancouver and in Victoria, and the Kwangan land where I've been born and raised. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to be making that in um, around. I don't know when I'm going to be making that. It, it's really, uh, yeah, um, it's just currently in production. That's all I'll say. <laughs> and uh, other than that, I've been busy with uh, my film, um, my uh, film and uh, employment program, and I'm uh, doing a paid internship soon with a Cree filmmaker named Loretta Todd, and I'll be. Uh, um, uh, doing a lot of research for a, a TV show that she's currently working on for APTN. It's part of my paid internship. And um, other than that, I'll be um, making a music video for my friends in Kamloops in a rap group called The Blackout Artists. DOA. <laughs> and uh, other than that, I have a lot of uh, different ideas. I don't really want to spoil them. <laughs> spoil the plots or anything, but um, yeah, ever since I first went to a two-day film school in Victoria when I was 16, I've, I've constantly been thinking of different uh, ideas uh, that I would do for a you know, feature-length film or, you know, um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of things in that. Uh, production. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I can talk more about that later. Thank you. Uh, Rose? Uh, one thing I'm really trying to focus on right now is uh, my demo reel, which is um, as a director of photography, a camera operator, and a focus puller. So um, that's kind of like where I'm just, I'm in the fourth year of my program, and we're really supposed to just focus on ourselves, and that's what I'm choosing to develop um, for now. Um, um, in the future, I'm hoping to write and direct uh, my own films, short films, and hopefully feature. Um, but like for now, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm interested in collaborating with other people and, and helping to um, make their vision happen, essentially, in terms of how they want the lighting of the scene to go. Um, it's like a sculpting of light, so it's kind of fun to do for me. Um, and it's a different type of, like, artistry within the filmmaking aspect. But um, I'm also interested in producing. I have um, some of my classmates who are in the early stages of their productions, and so I, I imagine, like, I'll be taking on roles for their films, but um, as far as, like, technicalities of what exactly I'm working on right now, I, I don't have anything specific right now, but... Um, I'm excited to have my demo reel. It'll hopefully lead to more work. And there's an artist I was excited, happy, and happy to work with, Janine. <laughs> um, so hopefully we can collaborate together in the future. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, I don't have any plans for making more films in the future, but I just decided right now an artist that I'm excited to see. I'm excited to see the panicking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, as far as plans for what I want to do as an artist later on, um, 
I'm planning on like starting post-secondary in the fall or, or in, in spring and um, like hopefully I can continue with like visual arts and um, I mean I have like it would be cool to maybe like learn a bit about animation but I don't know about that <laughs> um, but definitely my experience like um, making the short film with with Rose it would it would be like it would be helpful for if I wanted to do that, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, Great. Yeah, definitely. Um, other, other than my third, uh, my third film, uh, I'm also uh, working on some other things. Uh, in this program, I mean, we've been learning about animation and uh, at the at the artist collective that I work at called Shop Ron on East Hastings. Um, I, I want to start um, showing artists how to use this uh, editing program and, uh, you know, make their own animations with some, uh, you know, traditional native art or, uh, you know, um, uh, different things like that. And, uh, yeah, since I've been using this program, I've, I'm gonna be uh, showing showing a lot more people how to use it um, and tell their own stories and uh, you know um, start their own independent indigenous independent uh, production companies such as mine, Three Little Engines Productions, which is uh, um, developing. <laughs> I'm also doing uh, uh, some campaign videos for uh, my friend Audrey Siegel, who's running for city councilor right now, um, with COPE. Um, that and besides filmmaking, um, I, I work on a lot of music as well. Uh, starting up a band, uh, doing some, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, musical product, uh, pro projects and. Um, other stuff. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there was another question at the back. That's right. I'm also working on a, a short film for the Bill Reed Gallery for my Uncle Bo Dix uh, exhibit soon about our uh, journey to Ottawa's Parliament Hill for uh, what we call a copper cutting ceremony. So I'm working on a documentary about that as well. Okay. Hi. So uh, my pro or my question is about um, why filmmaking. Out of all the different mediums that you could have chosen to express yourself in, express your indigenous identity, your indigenous ideas, um, why did you go to filmmaking and not anything else? Great question. Okay. Alex. Uh, well, maybe 10 years ago, I would have never imagined myself to uh, be an aspiring uh, uh, storyteller in the cinematic medium. Um, but film has always been a, a big interest of mine ever since I was really young. Um, young kid with my mom going to Rogers back when they still had that, renting horror films and uh, <laughs> different things like that. Um, but I can't remember how old I was, but I saw a documentary called Real Engine about the history of uh, indigenous people in film. And it really made me a lot more interested in it. In, when you talk about the cinematic medium, ever since uh, Thomas Edison created the camera, um, people have been filming us um, and portraying us in, in certain ways. And in the silent era, we have a lot of uh, indigenous people making these great uh, silent films and telling their own stories. But as the, a Hollywood uh, system kind of progressed, uh, uh, I guess, in a way, um, back around the 40s and 50s, they started making more racist westerns where people like Elvis Presley and Boris Karloff and Charles Bronson and Chuck Connors, who was Geronimo in the film, <laughs> um, 
they they the portrays portrays in awful awful ways, you know, and they wouldn't do cultural research about the certain tribes they were speaking about, and they would spray tan themselves bronze, brown like us, and uh, portray us in these kind of horrendous ways, and uh, so hearing about that and um, learning about that. Um, as the years progress, there's mo there's been more uh, uh, great films, great uh, indigenous filmmakers, and um, now I think um, more um, independent storytellers that work in uh, cinema, and it's amazing. But um, I really was interested in it one day when I saw a poster for a two-day film school at UVic in Victoria for about four, four hundred or five hundred dollars, and it basically said on there, "It's like why go to a film school when you can learn about filmmaking in two days?" And I'm like, "Whoa, that sounds great! <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather learn in two days than spend a uh, you know a decade in." Film, learning about film theory and stuff. I'd, I'd be interested in it, but <laughs> but I'd rather I'd rather go out and do it myself. Um, uh, <clears throat> so why why uh, filmmaking other than other any other medium? Well, it's it's a it's a I think it's a great way to tell a story. Um, and I feel that there's a lot, there's a lot of amazing stories being told by indigenous filmmakers, but um, nobody's really been doing the kind of stuff that the kind of stories I want to tell, <laughs> and the kind of things I'm interested in. There's some certain genres where, um, like, I don't know, horror, or sci-fi, or, <laughs> or uh, uh, musicals or <laughs> you know um, a lot of different there's a lot of different genres that have never really been um, that have never really been used by indigenous filmmakers like um, like with my second movie there's an element of horror and uh, what I'd like to call <laughs> res drama or uh, or uh, <laughs> Or, or uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of different um, like uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's like romance and uh, <laughs> mystery and a lot of different things and uh, that's I'm kind of uh, no, that's that's very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about more about this stuff later as well. <laughs> So why do you feel uh, filmmaking is uh, an important medium as a storyteller? Uh, well, I didn't choose film. Film chose me. Um, and I just kind of embraced it. <laughs> Instead of running away. Um, sometimes I still feel like running away. <laughs> but um, I, I, I know that uh, it's important to tell indigenous stories because if we don't tell them, other people will and they'll get it wrong. Like, like that's what's been happening and it's just kind of like I want to help break that cycle and I want to help nurture other filmmakers to tell their stories. That's part of why I want to do so many different types of jobs within the film industry is I don't want to just be able to tell my stories. I want to help nurture other people in the stories that they tell. And part of the reason I'm going to film school and putting myself through this crazy film theory torture is because eventually I would like to be an instructor within a university setting. And like part of the reason... <laughs> Um, I like um, working with um, youth media, particularly indigenous youth media, has really um, like helped me see how film is a platform for youth voice and like in a place where people are feeling so disempowered and that they have no voice, film is an opportunity to help nurture that and give an outlet for that. So like I have seen firsthand people who have been told, oh like there's no hope for you, like oh you're just you're just gonna be drunk and like do nothing on the res, like for the rest of your life. And it's like, I've seen people do that. And, and like, I've seen the youth who come from that place and then they get a camera and then like, it starts out as a toy and then they realize it's a tool. So it's, it's like me seeing that happen within their mindset 
is just kind of like really powerful and, and it's just kind of like at the end of the day it's like my community has helped me out so much in terms of the opportunities that I've had I, I wish I could give like some of these opportunities back and help nurture other people tell their stories because they're so important they're so unique and it's just kind of like I don't know it's just like why not make film <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Damien? Why filmmaking? Uh, well, I failed at all the other arts. <laughs> You're a good painter. <laughs> and, Mc and Arby's wouldn't hire me anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're tough, man. <laughs> um... Yeah, I went to, like, right after high school, like, in high school, I was all into painting, visual arts, drawing, not so much into sculpting. But, yeah, I was into visual arts, and so that's what I really wanted to do. So right off the bat, I went to ACAD in Calgary, and I just hated it. Because <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not kicking visual arts, sorry. <laughs> um... It's mostly, I just didn't like it. I like painting and I like doing my own stuff. And like in the classes, they're like, still life, paint this. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to. <laughs> and yeah, so I like just sucked at all of that. Like my sculpture instructor, I think he just hated me. I never did anything. <laughs> and so yeah, I basically failed out of uh, art school. And uh, yeah, so I found filmmaking and... I've liked it ever since. And, I don't know, storytelling, I guess. It's like not, not filmmaking, more storytelling I like. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Kelsey? Um, I don't know, because um, filmmaking, obviously, like isn't my main like medium, but the reason why I'm like excited about it in general, seeing other people do it too, um, is the same stuff that like Alex and Rose like touched on is the fact that um, in the beginning of film, like it, it was actually like kind of a cool thing. Like uh, indigenous people got to tell their own stories and then eventually down the line it got like twisted into something else. And I think it's really cool and powerful to see like how um, people are claiming that back and there's indigenous like film writers and directors and stuff now telling indigenous stories not just like in North America but everywhere so it's really cool to see that like kind of film revolution <laughs> going on I guess yeah great thank you so uh, are there any more okay there is a question yeah. at the Okay. Where can we see your work? Where can we find your work? I mean, that's really specific. Why don't we start with you, Kelsey? Um, I have some work in claiming space, so um, uh, I don't even, I consider myself somebody who's like not a very well established artist yet. I'm like, I've only, I'm out of high school. I haven't started post secondary yet, but I'm excited to like, I guess, build on that. Like, I guess just working with the Native Youth Program, um, like, it helped me uh, start thinking about, like, things that I want to say, not even specifically about, like, indigenous politics, but, like, feminism, anything else. Like I, I don't have a lot of that represented in my work yet because I don't consider myself like a very, like, um, like an artist who's been practicing a long time, I guess. But um, yeah, before the Native Youth Program, like I, I was pretty much just wanting to like draw things that were pretty and stuff. So um, it's cool to like, uh, now that it's morphed into something more about like saying things that I want to say that I don't say in everyday conversations, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, Vimeo, YouTube. If you just look up Damien Eagle Bear, um, yeah, that's where a bunch of weird little videos that don't make sense. <laughs> Oh, you can see my demo reel. 
It's cut to Tribe Called Red, so you can at least jam to it if it doesn't look good. Great, thanks. Rose? Uh, well, right now I don't really have much out there for now. Um, I know that one of the films I was a director of photography for last year is playing at the LA Skins Film Fest. Um, I think it's next month. Um, and I'm pretty excited about that. And then... Um, <laughs> it's going to be screening later, or, or it screened last June at um, in the Indigenous Independent Digital Filmmaking Program. What's the title of the film? Bus Stop. Bus Stop. It's called Bus Stop. <laughs> um, and then um, this past summer, I was working on a documentary with Longhouse Media um, as an additional, or a, as a camera assistant and also additional camera operating. Um, so um, some of my camera operating work will be on PBS. Um, I'm not, I think it's still being edited, and then I think it's coming out next year. So um, that's a little ways away. Um, and, and what is the title of the... Oh, um, the name in progress for the documentary is called Clearwater. It's about ocean acidification um, and uh, the Coast Salish connection to the water. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, we, we followed the canoe journey this past summer, so that was really exciting. Um, we got to film killer whales off the back of a fishing boat on a red. <laughs> um, so that was exciting. Um, and then um, previously, like, um, one of the films I produced um, with Maya Tailfeather, she was the writer and director, um, the film was called A Red Girl's Reasoning, and that played on Air Canada. On, I had, had, like, a selection of, like, films in, in, in coordination with Imaginative. They had selection work, a selected selective of works um, available for people to see, so you could watch independent shorts or independent features, I think it was. And then um, I have some work here at Claiming Space. Um, there's a t-shirt and a print that I've worked on um, in the exhibition, and I'm not exactly sure what I have coming up in the future and when the screenings will be, but um, I imagine some of my camera work will be on display later this um, spring. Um, in the, at Capilano University in their Indigenous Independent Digital Filmmaking Program. And I'll have some, I think um, my demo reel will be screening um, in June um, at Capilano University as well in the Motion Picture Arts Program for the fourth years. So um, that's kind of what I have going right now. Great, thanks. Alex? Um, where can you see my stuff? Uh, well, I, I'd like to say you can see some of my uh, work and um, some of my films at the Gulf Island Film and Television School website, but I think they, they don't have it on their website and they don't have it on their YouTube channel, and the reason I think is because of the whole content of, the, of my two films, it deals with addiction, and <laughs> um, there's mention... Or, in the script, there's talk about you know all these, all these uh, you know kind of crazy topics like um, addiction, drug addiction, alcoholism, um, <clears throat> and I think it, it's just too yeah they they don't want to promote it. So my mentor Chris Bose, he has he has a film. Uh, he has a YouTube channel, and you can see some of the short films I've acted in in other students' uh, uh, short films, and you can see my uh, my um, my two films there as well. Um, other than that, there is a horror movie that I uh, helped film and act in for my friend Mark Atkins in uh, Victoria. And uh, I, I honestly wish I could tell you uh, where you could see that, but I honestly really uh, don't know. It's on YouTube, and I can't remember. <laughs> I can't even remember the title, because it's just the date. Like it's it's like called nine 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 eleven uh, twenty thirteen. Like, that that's when it was filmed. <clears throat> um, 
Other than that, I do have a blog spot that I created, but I, I kind of have forgotten about it and haven't really worked, <laughs> I haven't really written anything for it for a while. But I will, uh, I will start uh, writing on it more soon and showing some other things that I'm working on and other projects currently in production at, at my uh, Three Nil Engines productions on Blogspot. Um, <clears throat> Um, other than that, uh, I work on a lot of art as well. I'm learning how to carve right now. Um, a, lot, a lot of my family and people I know, like Corey Bolfit. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, you can probably see my work and uh, I'm gonna try uh, do an art show and a, a <clears throat> an art show and a, like a film, um, well, film festival at my artist collective that I work at, Shop, Shop Wrong. Um, yeah, so in the future, you might hear about that. And, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And, uh, one right, so one video I made uh, for a TV show in Alberta that never actually aired it. It was supposed to be on, like, the Access TV. It's like, but it's this little documentary thing I did called Kissing Cousins. It's really <laughs> funny. Madeline's in it and what you'd expect it to be. But if you go YouTube Kissing Cousins, they'll pop up and if like, maybe there's enough views, they'll actually put it on air because it's been like two years since they made it and they're like, oh yeah, it's, it's coming. It's, uh, it's not coming anymore. So go look it up. I'd like to check that out. So uh, we're almost near the end of our time here. Uh, so I have a question, but if there is any more burning questions in the audience, um, we will take those. Okay. So there is. Hi, I'll use the microphone. I'm having a sore voice today, but I wanted to say thank you for for um, the work that you're doing. I I took a one day. Uh, filmmaking at Mount Pleasant Community Center. Uh, they have a film um, festival, a community film festival in the fall, and uh, I think that the, the uh, date was September 23rd or around that time. But um, So I really appreciate the work that you all do and, and the amount of work that goes into that. One of the things that, was, that prevented me from... Um, from doing any more further to it was the all of the equipment that's needed, so the lighting and the microphones and all those kinds of things that I don't have access to. I'm just wondering if there's um, uh, some place in Vancouver that has that to borrow for uh, people who have a story to tell. Um, and then I'm wondering too about the program that you use. I was um, there was. Uh, to make your film, there was a program that they wanted us to use. That was a third. It was expensive, and there was a thirty-day, thirty-day trial. But it, it, anyhow, I didn't uh, end up doing anything with it. But I still have the idea um, for next year. I'm thinking about, and, and it, it involves um, Mount Pleasant um, and how uh, there was a lot of uh, Aboriginal organizations in Mount Pleasant area and they've all since moved to to other parts of uh, East Vancouver and just thinking about that and how we still have Kingsgate Mall is kind of the Indian Mall of, um, of uh, East Vancouver so just thinking about that and thinking about how the people were moved moved over so I'm wondering what your programs that you use to create it and about if there's any um, uh, sharing of uh, materials to to do a film. Sorry to interrupt. Um, can we keep these questions short? We're running out of time. Yes. So, very quick. Uh, uh, editing software is like Adobe Premiere. There's a cloud program, and you just use a credit card, and every 30 days it charges like 30 bucks. And uh, if you only need it for 30 days, then you only pay the 30 bucks, and then you cancel. So that's one easy way. So just look up Adobe Premiere uh, Premier Pro. And then uh, filmmaking gear, I'll just plug my own camera and light. So you can contact me, and I give pretty cheap deals, and I don't have insurance. But as long as you're <laughs> safe with it or you hire me to do your camera stuff, 
I'll work for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can come talk to me after. So yeah, maybe if we could just um, if um, people could uh, talk to the person with the question after. And so just to end it off really quick, you guys only get 15 second answers here. Uh, why do you think uh, being a storyteller is important? <laughs> wasted like five seconds. <laughs> um, um, I don't know. <laughs> That's not a 15 second answer. Your best, your best short answer. Um, I guess just whenever you, it's important to hear as many different stories as you can. So, um, uh, like if you, uh, <laughs> That's a good answer. That's yeah, a good answer. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, look at where the current stories we kind of tell ourselves has taken us. So that's why storytelling is important. Great. Um, our stories and our images have been taken from us um, by non-native people for so long. It's time to take them back for ourselves and share them with our communities and with the rest of the world. Great. What she said. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, w I was going to say something like that in other words. Like, um, I think it's important for us to tell our own stories because, uh, yeah, exactly. People have been uh, uh, tell telling stories about us and depicting us and, uh, you know, putting us in exhibits. Like that. Great. And, uh, yeah. and I think that concludes our morning show. Something like that. Well, yeah. I do. I'd like to thank all um, the panelists, Alex, Damien, Kelsey, uh, Rose, and Matt. Um, thank you all for giving an, a voice to Indigenous people and giving an Indigenous voice to the media. You guys all do very important work. Uh, we're going to take a, a one-hour break for lunch. Um, there's a cafe up that way, um, and I just want to remind everybody that the next session will begin at 1 o'clock sharp, so could you all please be back in your seats at 1 o'clock ready to begin. Thank you.